Well, good morning. Welcome to Colonial Church this morning. My name is Aaron Roberts, and I'm so glad you guys are here this morning. Um, as we begin our time together, in each one of our pews, we have our pew pad. So please grab one of those, place your name in it. It'll give us a record that you were here this morning. And if you see people around you that you don't necessarily know, be sure to, uh, to greet yourself, uh, greet, greet them, greet your, yes, greet yourself and that person here this morning. Um, also, if there is a prayer that you would like to share in our, in our community, please fill out one of the prayer cards and um, uh, place that in the offering plate later in the service. Now, yesterday's storms may have dampened our, our justice walk for immigration, but they did not hinder the work of justice. Um, I am very, very glad to announce this morning that after 22 years of imprisonment for a crime that he did not commit, Lamont McIntyre was freed on Friday. Now, yeah, um, I want to say too that that work, there are people in this congregation that a few months ago started working on Lamont's, uh, for, uh, on Lamont's case, and um, a small group of people made this happen. There has been Scooby-Doo detective work, I have no other way to put it, um, going on to, um, with people going out to visit. It all culminated with something on Friday I did not expect. The judge ordered the immediate release of, uh, of Lamont McIntyre from prison. At the best, I had hoped for a rehearing of the case. This was beyond what we, expe on what we expected. And so today as we pray for this, I want to start us off with a celebration for justice here this morning, which is pretty cool. Now, with that announcement, it's hard to follow that announcement, but it is rummage sale week too, so there is more to come. Our big rummage sale starts, um, it, well, it's already in some way started, but the sale itself starts this coming week. And today is your last day for donations. And nobody peek into my office because I have delayed until today and it is full of stuff for the rummage sale today. Um, after the sale wraps up, we have a, a couple events that you'll want to take note of. One of them is that uh, Vern Barnett, who is, used to write for the Star, uh, Kansas City Star, uh, is also the founder of the Kansas City Interfaith Council, is going to be speaking at a special brunch um, on, the, on the healing power of, of world religions. And that's going to be on Saturday, October 28th. It's a brunch with our friends from the Dialogue Institute. This is an opportunity, so, but they are looking for RSVPs. So if this is something that you um, would like to be part of, and I hope that you will, please, there's a sign up on the sign up board out in the Narthex. Please do RSVP. You can also RSVP via the web website as well. And then on Saturday, November 4th, we are just going to kick back. We're going to have a game night, very laid back that night. Um, it's going to start at 6.30 on that evening. And you just bring board games. We're going to be down in the social, social hall, board games and snacks. And we're going to play a little bit. And with that, um, um, we're going to start at 6. You can bring family and friends to it. Anybody's invited to come to it. It's just a chance to, get, to, get, to spend some time with one another. So I want to think, you to think about yourself for just a second. Do you think about things in the world and yourself the same way that you did 10 years ago? I hope not. Because I hope your conscience continues to evolve over time. Today we're going to be hearing the stories from the past of people who have gone through these kinds of evolution. We're going to, this is the month where we are talking about the 500 year mark from the beginning of the Protestant Reformation to now. And as we look back, we know that out of the past comes our future. And we can gain glimpses of what could be. Following a God who is good and all the time. So let's worship. It was changing quickly. In his lifetime, all this nation had known would be uprooted. His voice continues to bring words of warning and of hope. Let's begin our time of worship today with him as we rise together to sing Isaiah the prophet has written of old, which is 108 in our hymnal or on the screen.
seated. The prophet Isaiah lived in troubled times. He dared speak a warning to his nation and let us speak his words today. Doom to you who buy up all the houses and grab all the land for yourselves, evicting old owners, posting no trespassing signs, taking over the country, leaving everyone homeless and landless. Doom to those who call evil good and good evil, who present darkness as light and light as darkness, who make bitterness sweet and sweetness bitter. Doom to those who are wise in their own eyes, who think of themselves as clever. Doom to the wine-swigging warriors, mighty at mixing drinks, who spare the guilty for bribes and rob the innocent of their rights. Take a moment to consider what the Spirit is speaking. As surely as he proclaimed doom, Isaiah promised the grace of new hope. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch will sprout from his roots. The Lord's spirit will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. He will delight in fearing the Lord. He won't judge by appearances nor decide by hearsay. He will judge the needy with righteousness and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. So may it be. Amen. Please rise. can learn from one another. We can learn from our past to have hope for the future. What is true today is as it always has been. We need each other and we are called to live in peace. In that hope, let's greet everyone who is here today in the hope of friendship and peace. Get my Conversation this morning. Bye. I'll do it. All right. 
I'll tell you, having Camille come up here and pinch hit this morning, um, Sunday school directors, superintendents, whatever you want to call them, they are like gold. I love Camille. I also love the Sunday school director that I had in the church that I was serving up in Fargo. She also drove me nuts. Camille doesn't drive me as nuts. Um, (laughs) Shanna was on a deeply spiritual path. She had been part of Jewish communities, Orthodox Christian, and a whole smattering of mainline Christian traditions. And I appreciate it about how she would pull in from these various different traditions as she was trying to figure out who she was, what made her tick. And I think more than almost anyone I've known, she has taken her spiritual journey with God very seriously and deeply. She almost seemed to thrive on change and I remember she challenged us. She wanted to leave, lead what at that time was new, that Living the Question series. And so we led that together. And I remember marrying her and her, her spouse, Robert. And um, that was a wedding that I would never forget. Um, it was, uh, everything was done at the church. It was wild and crazy and wonderful. And I was there when their first baby was born, who I saw on Facebook's birthday was yesterday. But when their first baby was born, and she was born a couple months too early, and how she and Robert would take shifts sitting by that big incubator box with week for weeks at the hospital with Lauren. She has four kids now, and there have been a lot of changes on her journey. I was definitely not shocked when she told me that she had decided to go to seminary in Pittsburgh. Now, traditionally, when you go to seminary, you are sponsored by a particular religious tradition. Uh, The seminary education is supposed to kind of dovetail with that sponsorship on the path to ordained leadership. Now, it also did not shock me that while in seminary, Shanna would change church traditions faster than I would go through a pair of shoes. And we were talking on the phone one evening, and I remember asking her, what, at some point, don't you kind of need to pick a team? You know, like I did. You know, like generations before me did. You have to throw down with someone, otherwise you're constantly distracted, right? A new pastor was once advised by his mentor to stay on target and not be distracted. Here is his advice. I ask you to stay behind in Ephesus so that you could instruct certain individuals not to spread wrong teachings. They shouldn't pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Their teaching only causes useless guessing games instead of faithfulness to God's way of doing things. The goal of instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Because they missed this goal, some people have been distracted by talk that doesn't mean anything. A decade before our colonial ancestors landed at Plymouth Rock in the Mayflower, they were refugees living in Holland. They had fled England, went over, to, went over to Holland, because they were trying to escape religious persecution of King James. That is the same King James for whom the Bible version is now named. And as a group, they were known as the separatists, because they were separating themselves from the Church of England, which today we know as Anglican or Episcopalian. And the whole goal that these separatists had, they had a dream. And their dream was to get the church to be just like it was in the Bible, in those first century churches. Get rid of all the baggage, all the tradition, and get back to the basics 
of what the Christian church was meant to be. Now, one of these separatists was a man named John Smith, and not our John Smith, the fabulous restaurateur, a different John Smith, um, but he, this John Smith, joined about 50 other separatists who left England at the same time and went over to Holland. But John was like Shanna. He didn't really always feel part of a team. He didn't identify that this is my team. He was very independent-minded. Now, at one point, he had been ordained as an Anglican priest. And he noticed something. And it was about his separatist minister friends. Now, they were all for challenging and changing tradition. Except for when they weren't. For example, John wanted nothing to do with this newfangled King James version of the Bible. Because in his mind, if you are really serious about Bible, you're going to read it in Greek, for God's sake. Or you're at least going to find someone who can. And baptism. All the ministers that he knew, they knew that baptizing babies had only become a thing back during the Black Plague. Because that was, it was a comfort to surviving parents to not have any doubt that their dead child was baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. But their souls were alive. Now, there is zero explicit support for infant baptism in the Bible. And John felt that these separatists, these Luther-inspired biblical authority um, separatists, should have an issue with this whole baby baptizing thing. It turns out they didn't. Our congregational censors, we still do it. But John had a point. These separatist ministers had blind spots. We've all got blind spots. And with everything changing in the world, sometimes we cling to things, even if it's just because it makes us feel better. I know I do. But John wanted the true church, one that agreed with him, on every point. He wrote, baptism is not washing with water, but it is the baptism of the spirit, the confession of the mouth, and the washing with water. How can any man without great folly wash with water, which is the least and last of baptism? So coming to the conclusion that there is no church which could offer him a true baptism. John baptized himself. And that solved it. Why get distracted with the wrong teachings of all these others? Why get hung up on by all these people who cling to traditions because they make them feel better? Just form your own team. John's team today are known as Baptist churches. Christ is just like the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts, and all the parts are one body, even though there are many. We are all baptized by the Spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we are all given one Spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If an ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, I'm sorry, if the whole body were an eye, what would happen to seeing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? 
But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like God wanted. It's easy to get judgy. You can start thinking that you alone are wise, that you got it all figured out, that no one with half a brain could possibly see things differently than you without being an idiot or just a horrible person. And so we divide ourselves. You see it all the time. We love being right just a little bit more than we love our neighbor. And we fancy that being right makes us truly righteous. And this is where Shanna and John Smith part ways. It's kind of where their similarity ends. Shanna, she doesn't define herself by her tribe, by the team. But, oh, excuse me, she doesn't define herself necessarily by how she is different than other Christians. But she does value the team that she's on. She knows that she doesn't have it all figured out. And she doesn't expect her team to have it all figured out. And thus can't be on a journey with anyone who disagrees with her. And this is the gift that she gave me. It's that witness that we don't have to agree. She is trying to the best of her ability to answer the question that Jesus once asked Peter. He asked him, who do you say, who do you say that I am? And Peter tried to give the team response. He tried saying, well, this is what I've heard from others. Some say this, Jesus, and others say that. Jesus says, no, no, no. Who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter gave his answer. You are the Messiah, my Lord. Shanna is trying to find her answers. Why does she follow this Jesus? Why do his teachings matter so much with the person that she's trying to become? The truth is that for both Shanna and John Smith, their answers have changed over the course of time. And not to be overly trite, but isn't that what faith is? Faith is that journey. It's not a destination. It's not reaching some magical point of being right about everything. And all that, uh, all that any of us can really do honestly is to share that journey with another person. To set our judgment aside of another person's path and honor them with the same kind of love, the same respect that you want to have in this life. I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the spirit with the peace that ties you together. You are one body and one spirit, just as God also called you in one hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And I believe that this is the path to peace. I believe that our one true hope is not going to be in being right, being the smartest kid on the block. But it's in living and growing with humility, gentleness, and patience. Accepting each other with love as we are today or as we may become. 
Now I'm thinking, I heard some chuckling going on during our prayer of confession this morning. I didn't see who it was or anything like that, but I heard some chuckling going on. So I know that there may be somebody in your heart with whom you disagree greatly. Whose wrongs, whose sins, they get to you. Now that person has a name. Take a moment now and pray for that person with humility, with gentleness and patience. Ask God's Spirit to forgive that person. Let's pray. Now let us rise together to pray in song. Help us accept each other, which is number 388 in our hymnal. Please rise. Our journeys take us down many paths in life, and we look to the guidance and inspiration of Jesus Christ to help us find the way to go. Together we sacrifice a little so that none will have to suffer a lot. Will our ushers please receive our offerings?
Join me now to bless what we have just offered for God's purpose. Gracious God, receive the gift of our lives and this offering of our service to carry your love from this place to a world in need. This we pray in the name of Christ. With, with you and the Holy Spirit, reign in our hearts and lives, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. You know, as the choir was singing this morning, you think, you think it's just, you know, a couple dozen people and the amount of sound that they can bring out, just that, just fill the room. And then I was thinking about Lamont McIntyre. It was just a handful, a dozen or a few people that worked for justice in this case to get him freed. I think about the dozens of people yesterday who met to talk about making sure that people who are in this country, everyone has rights in establishing a good rule of law for our country. All of these things, it's never a huge group of people. John Smith, a couple dozen people. And what a few, the difference a few dozen people can make in the world. It's extraordinary. You don't become righteous by being right about everything. What you find is that it's by living with humility, gentleness, and patience that you grow into the best ver version of yourself, a Christ-like version, a Christian version. And so we come to this time of prayer where we say the things that are on our heart, things that we've put out there, and after each prayer I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and can we pray it together saying, hear our prayer. Today we celebrate the delayed justice for Lamont McIntyre, wrongly imprisoned for 22 years. And we thank God for those who work for justice. And we also acknowledge the impossible debt of 22 years of freedom lost. Lord, in your mercy. We want to pray for, those, for the fires that are going out, out in California, for Santa, Santa Rosa and other places. My best, one of my best friends from high school was forced to flee from his home. Others in this congregation, we know people who are fleeing from, from this right now. And we pray for all those to remember that it is most important that we care. We will work together for healing, keep themselves safe. And for those people who are fighting these fires, keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. And for those people who are in the steps of recovery, we want to pray for Puerto Rico and for Houston and these places that are going to need long-term recovery and for us to continue to find ways to be part of that recovery because as we've said, we all are going to have to sacrifice a little so that none have to suffer a lot. We can do that. Lord, in your mercy. And Kirsten Phillips was released from the hospital this past week. And if you see her today, she has had remarkable healing. And she has been feeling a call on her life to do some more work for justice. And I'm sure if you ask her, she'll tell you about that. But she is feeling that call. So we ask for God to heal her quickly so she can get about that work. Lord, in your mercy. Amy Hagedorn asked for prayers for Nancy Kern, whose mother died recently from cancer. And so we pray for God's comforter to be with Nancy in the days and the weeks and the years ahead. Lord, in your mercy. And Susie Stroud's son and, and Tyler Stroud's father, Jeff, continues to be hospitalized with uh, yet, a yet-to-be-diagnosed brain condition. Actually, I, I just, Susie told me this morning he has been now released to rehab. He has a long way to go, but um, we want to just pray for him this morning and ask for God's presence and healing to be in him. Lord, in your mercy. And we want to hold Joyce Fick in our prayer, prayers, too. She was hospitalized and released yesterday, so she is at home. She's not going to have surgery, but we just want to pray for God to help her with the relief from pain that she's had. Lord, in your mercy. Are you carrying around harsh judgments? Maybe for yourself? Maybe for someone else? Maybe you'd like to set those down, be rid of those. 
Now is the time to take that up with God. Let's pray together silently. In our community's continuing prayers, we continue to keep all people who are living and serving in the middle of war in our prayer, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to keep them safe and to help us all find a path to peace. And for caregivers and for those living with dementia, may they receive the respect and the love they deserve. And we pray for God's guidance for this nation's ideals of freedom and justice for all people in these turbulent times. And we pray for all people who are living in the shadow of depression and mental illness. And we ask for God's light of hope to shine. And for those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for those loved ones in our lives who are with cancer and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray for Heather Rubesh, Sean Bolter, Betty Joyce, Al Turner, Betty Sexton, Kayla Ball, Andrew Wood, Kelly Hokinson, Nathan Green, Elena Thorne, Mark Tavault, and Lee Frommelt. And we ask for God's strength to flow from our prayers to them. Deliver us from evil. May God rain down a spirit of peace, the peace we cry out for. Let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The rummage sale is about to begin. As we begin, the gifts of one person move into the lives and are shared with another. And for me, I will tell you what the highlight of this week is. It's Molly's table. Thursday night, a group of women who are trying to rebuild their homes and their lives are going to come and they're going to shop down there for free. And if you've never helped out with Molly's Table before, if you want to see the Holy Spirit this week, sign up for Thursday. It's a beautiful thing. So as we move into this week and for all those things that will happen, Let's rise now with a hymn to bless all the children of God. It's number 533 in our hymnal or on screen. Please rise.
hope that you've experienced something. Something today to feed your spirit's growth. Keep growing. Push yourself to discover new love. And to admit your prejudices. You will open the door to a much greater kingdom. This is an important part of our journey with God. So now will you turn toward the center aisle as we vow to continue that journey with God and with one another. And as always, if you're not at a point in your life where you feel like you can make this covenant, that is perfectly fine. Please receive it as a blessing and a prayer that someday you will. We covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in Christian love. We seek to worship God in spirit and in truth and to love our neighbor as ourselves. With God's help, we will honor Colonial Church in our conduct, support its program, and extend... of worship is now over, but our service begins now. So go in peace and live passionately and love faithfully and celebrate every moment of life that you have from now until your life's finale. Because our God of resurrecting grace goes with you always. Amen. <laughs>